bioinformatics and computational biology, but it's not genomics. Instead, it's the uh, intersection between computer vision and, uh, and biology. Right, cool, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's a bit about myself. So my name's Adrian. I'm in the final semester of the Masters of Bioinformatics program that Harriet just spoke about. Come from a mathematics background, but then I sort of uh, gravitated towards statistics and computer science. Um, then after doing an internship at the VLSCI, ended up doing the Masters, and it's been great so far. So I'm just going to talk a bit about my Masters research project, which is Microscopium, a tool for interactive clustering of high-content screen images. Uh, thanks to the uh, comprehensive uh, introductions to biology from Bernie and Harriet, I don't need to say much else, except I'm just going to talk a bit about forward genetics and reverse genetics. So forward genetics is also known as classical genetics. It dates back to the work of uh, George Mendel, who did the work with the plants, discovered the patterns of dominant and recessive inheritance. And the process in forward genetics is that you isolate your phenotype of interest and then do some sort of mapping to find the location of the gene. The classic example here is with um, cystic, the cystic fibrosis gene. They found that one by doing pedigree studies in families where cystic fibrosis was present and they did mapping to actually find out where the gene was. And sort of the converse of forward genetics is reverse genetics. That's a little bit different because we actually disturb the genes and then actually work out what the determined uh, phenotype is after disturbing those genes. And we're able to actually do this in a very high throughput manner now. We can actually interrogate the entire genome and see what results. So just the difference between forward and reverse genetics again. So with forward genetics, you have your mutant phenotypes, find the gene. Reverse genetics, you disturb the genes, find what the mutant phenotype is. And one such way of doing reverse genetics on a large scale is high content screening. So how high content screening works is you have these 384 well plates, like you can see up on the slides there. And in each one of those wells on the plate, you put in some cell sample, then the cell sample's gene um, is, to start, you know, it's disturbed somehow. So that could be like interference RNA, which shuts off a particular gene. And then we get a whole bunch of these plates and then run them through these machines. So the machine there is the Fermo Scientific High Content Screening Platform at Peter McCallum Cancer Institute. Now this thing is just really cool. So it take, automatically will act, um, treat all of the genes on a bunch of these plates, run them through the system and take images of each of those genes. And seeing the robot arm in action, watching it go through that thing, it's just a really cool thing to see. So the idea of a high, high content screening is seeing is believing. So we actually take images of these cells after they've, been after they've had a gene perturbated. So how do we actually go about biological discoveries from these images? So the usual analysis method is that one or two parameters are quantified from the image. That could be such, um, like the number of cells that are present in the image or the size of the cells in the images. And then these parameters are reduced to a z-score based on the change versus the control samples. Uh, so I'm not really a big fan of graphs and talks, but this is actually a really good uh, illustration of how these studies would work. So for the most part, you've got insignificant z-scores, which means there was no big change against the controls. But in this case, a couple of genes, after some pathway analysis, were found to actually be uh, of interest um, based on those z-scores. So this approach has been massively successful in both drug discovery and biological research, but we think that we can do better. Now, just as I was starting my master's project, this awesome paper came out where a few of the heavy hitters in high content screening basically said, yes, high content screening has been massively successful, but we don't think that we're actually getting enough information out of our data sets. Uh, the paper's worth a read if you've got any interest at all in this area, but the basis of their argument is, all right, so let's just pretend that these are pictures of cells of different shapes and sizes. Now, if I'm only measuring the count of the cells and the shape of the cells, the only thing that's going to be significant to me is that sample on the top right-hand side where you've got an increased number of cells. But I'm not actually quantifying 
the shape of the cells. So in my study, I'm going to completely miss that phenotype on the bottom left-hand side where you've got circles because it's the exact same area and the exact same count as the rest of the samples in the study. And that result there, that could be a nature paper, that could result to a Nobel Prize, what have you. So if you're only focusing on a couple of parameters and miss that, yeah, you've played yourself, as the kids say these days. So the idea behind microscopium is we don't just measure a couple of features from the images. We use an unbiased method where we take an everything but the kitchen sink approach and quantify hundreds of parameters from each of these images with the goal in mind of capturing all the variation in the data set. Then using these parameters, the images are grouped together according to their phenotypic similarity. And then the results are presented in an interactive web interface. So really what we'd want microscopium to do is to take those cells from earlier and group them like this, where you've got the increased number of cells on the top right-hand side of its own group, you've got the circles in their own group, and then those other two groups where you've got a bunch of cells clustered together in the top corner, and then cells a bit more spread out, also put into their own groups. So, to my, uh, so this is like a diagram of how microscopium works. So it comprises of uh, three different components. The first of those is the Python library. So this comprises all of our methods that handle the image processing, feature extraction, and statistical analysis required to get what we want out of the images. Then the images are stored into a database. And then from the database, our web interface allows for interactive exploration of the data set and allows for filtering to look for particular uh, properties of interest in your data set. So how does it all work? So that there is an image of a, um, of a well that's gone through a high content screen platform. Because uh, it's an image, there's actually composes of three different components a red channel, a blue channel, and a green channel. Uh, when you split up the image, it's basically just three different images that are black and white. And then we apply thresholding to those images. So with thresholding, you're just choosing some value. And if any part of the image is greater than that value, and there's a connected group of uh, pixels that are greater than that value, you just label it as being a, uh, as an object in the image. Now, in our case, we, uh, as you can particularly see in the middle case, with the thresholding, you're collecting you know, possibly groups of cells or just noise when you're doing the labeling, but we don't care. We're just interested in just getting an idea of what the image actually looks like. So after we've done the thresholding, we quantify properties of each of those objects identified in the image. So there's a whole bunch of properties. I'm not going to go through all of them because I just don't have the time. But those include the area, so the number of pixels in each of the objects in the image, and eccentricity, which is just a number between 0 and 1, where if it's close to 0, it's a very circular object. And if it's close to uh, 1, it's just basically like a line segment. Then for each of those properties, we quantify the quintiles. So we get sort of like you know, the value of the um, bottom fifth quintile, the median, the upper 95th percentile. And the result is we have a high dimension feature vector, which is just fancy math speak for. We've got an array of a bunch of numbers that describe the image. So we want to actually take that high dimension vector and put it in a two dimensional space. So that way, because the human eye can't actually look at high dimensions, but we can look at them in lower dimensions which is where we then apply dimensionality reduction. And normally this is the slide where I'd fill it with lots of maps and all that, but I'm just going to be really succinct here. So principal components analysis is one of the methods that we use. You might have come across it if you've done first or second year statistics. Basically, it just finds linear combinations of those features that best captures all of the variation across the data set. But a downside to principal components analysis is that it's quite sensitive to outliers. And the other method we're using is a method that's very much in vogue at the moment called stochastic neighborhood embedding. There's some pretty complicated maths behind it. But basically, it just creates a function such that 
similar samples will be attracted to each other in this two-dimensional space, while the similar objects will be repelled in a two-dimensional space. And what's great is that it's robust against outliers and it incurs inherent grouping in your data set. So I'll just provide a, now I'll just do a live demo of Microscopium in action. And it should give you a better idea of what I mean. If I could just get a pair on the projector, that would be awesome. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. All right, cool. So the data set that we're looking at here, so this was a, uh, this is uh, a screen that was done a few years ago on a collection of HT29 colon cancer cells where 1,000 different genes were treated using short hairpin RNA. So in other words, 1,000 different genes were um, stopped from expressing in order to determine what effect it actually had on the cell. So in Microscope here, Mike and I will look at my images using the principal con components analysis view or the, uh, the TSNE view. So I was saying before, with principal components analysis is it gets completely blown out by outliers, which is good and bad because it's quite good at detecting outliers, which is often caused by something like a piece of hair or a piece of fluff getting into the camera. But it's not that great for wanting to explore the data set which is what's cool about ts &E. So without any prior training or knowledge, it's actually created this grouping of all of the images. So in the Microscopium interface, I can click around this scatter plot, and each time I click on one of those points, what I'm getting is the image that's represented in that, by that point, and it's 25 nearest neighbors. So this being the images that our features are determined the most similar to the one that I've just clicked on. And when I click around the graph, yeah, a few of the images are missing because I haven't loaded them all on my laptop. By clicking around the graph, I've actually captured most of the variation in the data set. And I can zoom in to different parts of the scatter plot. So in here it's created this clustering of images where the cell's not being expressed much at all. And I can also go to other parts of the uh, graph by clicking on the images. And you can see that's updating the scatter plot. Then on the bottom here, what I have is a line plot. So, that, so this represents the standardized scores for that large high dimension fe feature vector that I was talking about. And when I click on that line plot, I get a distribution of that particular feature of how it appears across the entire data set. And we've also implemented a filter because one of our collaborators has like a massive high content screening data set and just had the question of, if I tell you some particular gene that was targeted, are you able to just bring up the, all of the images according to that? And none of the software that's uh, used in high content screening actually enables that. So we implemented this filter. So let's just say my favorite gene in the world is ROC1. So if I add ROC1 to the filter, those points get highlighted in the scatter plot. And I can click on those and immediately see what they actually look like. Oh, that was easy. So, yeah, so that's the current state of the web interface and where Microscopium is at the moment. Uh, pretty excited at what we've done so far. We've created a novel tool that enables biologists to get more out of their high content screen data sets and actually just explore the data.
because uh, this is, yeah, because the topic today is open source and bioinformatics, I'll just talk about some of the libraries and technologies we've used to construct Microscopium. So all of our image analysis and statistical analysis is done using scikit-image and scikit-learn in Python. The database that we're using for uh, is MongoDB. And for the web interface, so I've built the back end using the uh, web framework Flask in Python. And all of the interactivity and all of the charts have been created using the awesome D3 library in JavaScript and jQuery to put, uh, put together like all the other JavaScript that ties the interface together. So I've got one more semester to work on this. We've got some um, ambitious new plans and I'm pretty excited. So what we'd like to do is improve our image pre-processing. So a bit of illumination correction happens and we do some fancy things to actually determine that threshold value when we're finding objects in each image. And we'd like to actually improve that, make it more robust, make it a lot faster. We wanna add some new views to the web interface. So in that scatter plot that I ran through earlier, each one of those points represented one particular sample in the data set, but quite often replicate samples will be made. So I'll target the exact same gene, but multiple times just to make sure that I'm getting a repeatable result. We like to actually make it such that each point on that scatter plot could also represent one of the genes that you've targeted. So the idea behind that would be, if I have a bunch of genes that have clustered together because they've got, had the exact same phenotypic effect, maybe that's a new cell pathway that we didn't know about before. And that's something that wouldn't have, we wouldn't have been able to find out using the previous Z-score methods. We'd like to add some more bioinformatics tools to the web interface. So if I could just say, select a bunch of genes that I've affected in the web interface, and I could send those off to a database, and that would bring back a bunch of common gene annotation terms. So that would just uh, tell me whether or not those genes have anything in common. And finally, we'd also like to make it much easier to apply Microscopium to raw screen data sets. So the ultimate vision would be, let's say I've got a full raw data set taken off a high content screening machine. I'd love to just be able to point Microscopium to that data set, and then it spits out that web interface that I was running earlier. Uh, so that demo that I showed earlier, that's actually been put online for this conference. So if you wanted to have a go yourself and just get an idea of how it works, please check out play.microscopium.io. I'd love to get your feedback. Please just, you know, because <laughs> that's the first time I've actually released it to the public. So I'd love to get your feedback. Uh, we are passionate about open source and open science. So all of our code is up on GitHub if anyone wanted to have a look. And if you've got any questions or, you know, just wanted to troll me or whatever, that's my email address, so please feel free to get in touch. And that's Microscopium, so thanks for listening. Any questions? Are there any questions?